into the last uh, conference of this encounter, and is uh, the Professor Stephen Smith. Um, he's a Warren Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of San Diego and co-director of at the University's Institute for Law and Religion. He's a graduate of Brigham Young University and Yale Law School. Professor Smith has also taught at different universities in, in the United States, Notre Dame, Colorado, and the University of Idaho. His scholarly work mostly in areas of mm, law, uh, constitutional law, includes the rise and decline of American religious freedom, the disenchantment of secular discourse, and laws quandary. That is the last one. No, the last one is the former one. It is not written in the, in the ordinary order. And uh, the topic for us is naturalism, secularism, and the trajectory of history. A beautiful uh, speech that uh, I, I hope that all of us will enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Maria. Um, and thanks, uh, Father Catawana, for inviting me to participate in this conference uh, as someone who um, doesn't really work with the topics that have been discussed here. This has been very instructive for me. I've enjoyed it a lot, uh, and I feel like it's an honor to participate here. It's a little intimidating also uh, as a lawyer among philosophers to try and address you, but um, I think I take some comfort in the thought that there's been a whole lot of value delivered already, and anything you might get from now on is just a bonus. So, uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, in the dark days just preceding World War II, T.S. Eliot gave a series of lectures at Cambridge University uh, the lectures advanced an argument that, though it may seem prima facie implausible and even offensive to contemporary readers, is at least intriguing. The central contention was that the future of Western societies would be determined by a contest between Christianity and a rival that Eliot described as modern paganism. I believe, Eliot explained, that the choice before us is between the formation of a new Christian culture and the acceptance of a pagan one. The glaring problem with this assessment, it may seem, is that it comes approximately a, a millennium and a half too late. Eliot's diagnosis might have been apt for the Roman world of the second and third and fourth centuries. At that time, paganism and Christianity did constitute the principal alternatives, or so we may suppose. As we know, or think we know, Christianity ultimately prevailed in that struggle, so that from late antiquity through the early modern period, Western peoples lived in what might be described as Christian societies. But the live alternative today to the Christian political and cultural ordering, or the successor to it, is not a pagan society, it would seem, but rather a secular one. Thus, we live today in a secular age, as the title of a hefty volume by Charles Taylor puts it, which is unlike, quote, anything else in human history. This historical paradigm in which the West has moved in stages from classical paganism to Christendom and on to modern secularism is widely held and indeed taken as almost axiomatic in many quarters. To be sure, secularism has not taken hold as rapidly and religion hasn't declined as thoroughly as many theorists anticipated and hoped. It may be that the triumph of secularism is not inevitable as was once thought. Even so, those are the viable candidates, Christianity, or more broadly religion, and secularism, not paganism. In the face of this understandable skepticism, I'm nonetheless interested in exploring and attempting to defend Eliot's thesis, primarily for the same reason he offered it. Eliot explained that he was advancing his admittedly unconventional interpretation in response to, quote, immediate perplexities that fill our minds. He declared as well his suspicion that the current terms in which we discuss international affairs and political theory may only tend to conceal from us the real issues of contemporary civilization. I have a similar suspicion, which is why Eliot's somewhat contrarian interpretation seems of potential value. But what does any of this have to do with naturalism, the subject of this conference? 
Well, quite a lot, I think. The much predicted triumph of secularism has been closely tied to the widespread view that with the success of modern science, a naturalistic approach to the world has become pretty much obligatory, at least for people of education and intellectual responsibility. Other ways of understanding the world are presumptively inferior. In some quarters, especially in academia, naturalism has become virtually mandatory. With apologies, I'm gonna quote a footnote here. Um, the quotation from Hilary Putnam taken from an essay that was included in a volume edited by Mario Di Caro. Putnam says, philosophers announce in one or another conspicuous place in their essays and books that they are naturalists and that the view or account being defended is a naturalist one. This announcement in its placing and emphasis resembles the placing of the announcement in articles written in Stalin's Soviet Union that a view was in agreement with comrade Stalin's. As in the case of the latter announcement, it is supposed to be clear that any view that is not naturalist, not in agreement with comrade Stalin's, is anathema and could not possibly be correct. Well, Eliot's thesis implicitly rejects that mandate, I think. Or at least it denies that naturalism is or will be the dominant worldview as a cultural or political matter. So looking at Eliot's thesis is a way of reflecting on one dimension of naturalism. But I should make clear at the outset that there are important questions that this angle of investigation does not directly address. First, it doesn't purport to examine whether naturalism is true, so to speak. Second, it doesn't pronounce upon the much discussed question of whether naturalism or secularism generally can provide an adequate basis for ethics. Those questions, and especially the second one, are in the vicinity of what I'll be considering, but this paper need not and doesn't take a position on either of them. Rather, my concern will be with the ongoing cultural significance of naturalism, um, as a, of, of naturalism in the trajectory of history and indirectly of naturalism as a viable basis of human life and society. Those are perhaps not the questions that philosophers are most directly interested in, but they are, I think, large and important questions large and important enough, in fact, that I won't even pretend to offer confident answers to them. Rather, my investigation of Eliot's thesis is intended to suggest one way of reflecting on the questions. Um, this paper, I should also warn, is extracted and adapted from a much longer project, work in progress, actually. And I'll need to give some of the steps in very summary form so they can say more about the question of historical trajectory. So I need to begin by offering an account of paganism, one that might help make sense of Eliot's references to modern paganism. For most people today, the term paganism probably elicits two main images. One is of delightful stories about capricious and lascivious deities squabbling with each other on Mount Olympus and occasionally coming down to rescue some favored warrior or to consort with some especially fetching maiden. The other is a priest sacrificing bulls to Zeus or Apollo and dictating political and military decisions by studying the entrails of animals. If this is what paganism is taken to mean, Eliot's diagnosis of modern prospects is dead from the outset, I think. No one believes or wants to return to that sort of thing. But must paganism be understood only in terms of these ancient stories and practices? Is that the most helpful or illuminating understanding? To address that question, it will be helpful to begin with a broader category, religion. The term notoriously eludes any kind of canonical definition, but for our purposes, I think religion can be usefully understood in terms of two themes. One theme is the human need for meaning. The other is the human encounter with a reality often described as the holy or the sacred. So let me elaborate very briefly. Growing out of his experience as a prisoner in the Nazi death camps, the psychologist Viktor Frankl argued that, quote, man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, but rather to see a meaning in his life. What people most urgently need, Frankel insisted, is a why for life. Given this why, quote, man is even ready to suffer on the condition that his suffering has a meaning. In a similar vein, Jonathan Sachs, formerly chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of Great Britain, contends that meaning is central to human life. Quote, we are meaning-seeking animals. It is what makes us unique. To be human is to ask the question, why? But what could provide that sort of meaning? Both Frankel and Sachs suggested that the answer lies in religion. Sachs quotes Wittgenstein, to believe in God means to understand the question about the meaning of life. To believe in God means to see that the facts of the world are not the end of the matter. 
To believe in God means to see that life has a meaning. Leaving for the moment that contention, though, and passing over some complex questions that will probably occupy most of a chapter in the longer project, let me bring in the second theme, the human encounter with the sacred or the holy. In his classic account, The Idea of the Holy, the German scholar Rudolf Otto contended that the source of religion was the direct experience of a transcendent reality, the holy. This reality is not merely subjective, it is, quote, felt as objective and outside the self. The holy is sui generis, Otto thought, not reducible or analyzable into anything else. Nonetheless, his book amounted to a diligent effort to explicate the concept of the holy. Otto tried to do this in part by inventing and analyzing terms, the numinous mysterium tremendum, mysterium tremendum and in part by suggesting a variety of imperfect analogies. In this vein, he discussed similarities between the experience of the holy and the sense of awe, the, quote, horror and shudder in ghost stories, the sense of the sublime, the feeling of the erotic, and the blissful rejoicing experienced when listening to beautiful music. Though different, the meaning and the sacredness accounts of religion seem fully compatible, even convergent. In the religious view, the sacred or holy reality is what confers meaning on the world, as Sachs and Wittgenstein suggested. Without the luxury of lingering over important questions here, though, we now need to ask a further question leading to a key distinction. Where is the sacred? Where is it situated exactly? Religious answers to that question have fallen into two main families. One answer, call it the imminent view, locates the sacred within nature or within the world. The other answer, the transcendent answer, asserts that the sacred or the holy is ultimately a reality in some sense outside nature or beyond time and space. In this vein, Abraham Heschel contrasted the attitude of ancient Greek religion with that of what he called biblical man. Greek religion identified the sublime with nature and more generally with the world. In essence, it sanctified the, the world. By contrast, biblical man understood the sublime as a manifestation of something or someone who stood behind and above nature and the world. More recently, but in a similar vein, the German Egyptologist Jan Osman argues that the gods of the ancient world were actors of and within this world. The god of Judaism and Christianity, by contrast, is, quote, the creator of the world, which he guides in its course and maintains in its existence an invisible, hidden, spiritual god who dwells beyond time and space. Osman argues that the shift from the this-worldly religiosity of Egypt, Greece, and Rome to the monotheistic faiths of later Judaism and Christianity represented a radical and portentous transformation, one that, quote, has had a more profound impact on the world we live in today than any political upheaval. This shift brought, quote, with it a new mentality and a new spirituality which have decisively shaped the Western image of man. In light of this crucial distinction, we can say then that paganism refers to a religious orientation that sacralizes nature or that locates the sacred within this world. To be sure, paganism has historically manifested itself in a dizzying variety of outward forms, but its essence lies in its imminent sacralizing tendency. In declining to identify paganism with its more famous specific forms, such as Olympian myths, animal sacrifices, and auspices or divination, I think I'm merely following a pattern of thought already clearly evident in antiquity. Thus, in the first century BC, the encyclopedic scholar Marcus Varro distinguished among three forms or levels of Roman religion, the mythical, the civic, and the philosophical, or the natural. It was entirely possible to scoff at the mythical religion, as Varro and many other educated Romans did, and even to disdain the civic religion, the auspices, sacrifices, and so forth, as Seneca did, at least according to Augustine, while devoutly adhering to pagan religion in a philosophical sense. There are complicated questions here again, but I'm suggesting that the philosophizing of Stoic and Neoplatonic pagans amounted to an effort to defend the pagan sacralization of nature while abandoning at least literal belief in the pagan deities. In any case, this interpretation of paganism would allow us to understand Eliot's diagnosis in something like these terms. The choice for modern societies is between adhering to a transcendent religiosity, Christianity being the most influential version, or shifting to a more imminent religiosity. But even though this assessment is no longer contemplating a return to the sacrificing of bulls, it may still seem deeply implausible. That is because, as noted, the live alternative to Christianity today seems not to be imminent religiosity, 
but rather a turn away from religion altogether in favor of what is usually called secularism. The historical trajectory, once again, has been from the imminent religiosity of paganism to the transcendent religiosity most powerfully manifest in Christianity to the non-religiosity of secularism, or so goes a familiar story. In this shift, uh, uh, historical shift to secularism, naturalism has not been the only source, but it has arguably been the most powerful. The other major influence, I think, has been political in nature. Secularism has come to be seen as the antidote to the conflicts manifest in the wars of religion that followed the breakup of Christendom, and as the solution to the challenges presented by modern pluralism. This political secularism doesn't oppose religion per se, but rather prescribes that it be screened out of government and relegated to the private sphere. By contrast, the other and more philosophical source of secularism is more ambitious, predicting, and sometimes prescribing a general decline of religion. The central development in this episode is the rise of modern science, which teaches us to see the world in different and less religious ways. Science operates on the basis of naturalistic premises. What the universe consists of is the sort of material or naturally empirical, empirically observable stuff susceptible to scientific investigation. This view is secular because it excludes non-natural or religious entities like spirit or God and non-empirical or religious methods of knowing like revelation. We've heard quite a lot about that, I think, over the last days. <laughs> to be sure, scientists sometimes describe theirs as a methodological naturalism. The approach employs naturalistic assumptions for the working purposes of the scientific enterprise, but remains agnostic about whether there are realities beyond the natural world. Consequently, scientists can be, and sometimes are devoutly religious when off duty, so to speak. Even so, the conspicuous successes of science can lead its devotees to suppose that other non-scientific views of the world are inferior, primitive, not to be trusted. In this spirit, after perceptive and sympathetic depictions of the classical Greek and Christian worldviews, the philosopher Luke Ferry pronounces that science has rendered these views unavailable. Quote, neither the ancient model nor the Christian model remain credible for anyone of a critical and informed disposition. The comprehensive secularism associated with a naturalistic worldview implies, as Max Weber famously put it, the disenchantment of the world. Science and secularism can thus be viewed as completing a process that Christianity set in motion. The classical world was enchanted. It was full of gods. Every hill, every valley, every stream or lake had its proper deity. Judaism and then Christianity banished all of these gods in favor of the one true God. A stern and lofty sovereign, however, who was incorporeal and metaphysically detached from time and space, so the world itself became less immediately charged with divinity. The naturalism of modern comprehensive secularism in turn dissolves that far off God as well, leaving the cosmos bereft of sacredness and enchantment altogether. A poignant but quietly heroic, or perhaps mock heroic, statement of this spiritually barren condition comes from the philosopher Bertrand Russell. Russell says that man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be self safely built. Um, okay. As this picture began to emerge in the course of secularization, a question was often raised along with it. Can human beings actually live under the apprehension of such a forbiddingly empty world? Writing in the aftermath of World War II, the Princeton philosopher W.T. Stace was doubtful. Science, he said, has given us, quote, a new imaginative picture of the world. The world, according to this picture, is purposeless, senseless, meaningless. Nature is nothing but matter in motion. This new worldview, Stace thought, quote, though silent and unnoticed, was the greatest revolution in human history, far outweighing in importance any of the political revolutions whose thunder has reverberated through the world. That was because, quote, if the scheme of things is purposeless and meaningless, then the life of man is purposeless and meaningless too. Everything is futile. All effort is in the end worthless. 
the best we might do in this disenchanted and purposeless world is to live out our days in, quote, quiet content, accepting and resignedly what cannot be helped, not expecting the impossible, and being thankful for small mercies. And yet, as a matter of historical development, Russell and Stace and the various prophets of secularization have proven to be highly fallible prognosticators. People and politics have not settled into the Epicurean quietism Stace prescribed, quite the contrary. More generally, religion has emphatically not gone away. In many contexts, it appears to be more vibrant than ever. So, what has happened? Well, part of the answer is well known. Traditional transcendent religions, such as Christianity and devout Judaism, have proven to be more adaptable and resilient than many had expected, in many parts of the world at least. That much seems obvious. But I'm interested here in a different development, namely the revival of a commitment to the sacred in more surprising and thoroughly secular cultural neighborhoods. Rather than attempt any general sociological analysis, I want to focus on one important representative figure, Ronald Dworkin, arguably the most important legal philosopher, at least in the English-speaking world, over the last quarter of a century or so. Though a consummately secular thinker, from his earliest writings, Dworkin also resisted the pervasive consequentialist and interest calculating character of modern legal thought. He championed rights, rights understood as trumps or categorical constraints on laws or governmental actions based on consequentialist policies. He criticized law and economics. He advocated a form of legal interpretation in which law would be construed not to further either the subjective intentions of the enactors or the utilitarian aims of present day policymakers. Rather, law would be interpreted in accordance with the best available moral philosophy. But in a secular naturalistic world, where were these rights and categorical constraints and moral imperatives supposed to come from? Dworkin struggled with the question. In one early essay, he appeared to embrace a kind of refined moral conventionalism. But this seemed a vulnerable position. In a later essay, Dworkin tried to use utilitarianism against itself or against the unchecked implementation of policies calculated to further utilitarian preferences by arguing that some kinds of legal restrictions that he disfavored, such as laws regulating pornography, violated the utilitarian premise that everyone's utility should be counted equally. This argument was clever, but as critics persuasively objected, demonstrably flawed. Still later, Dworkin came out in favor of what he at least called moral realism. There are objectively more right answers to moral questions, he asserted. Slavery is and always was wrong, whether or not it was conventional and whether or not people believed it was wrong. In the same essay, though, while declaring that morality was objective, Dworkin also insisted that it was not actually any sort of object. Morality is not part of, quote, the fabric of the universe. This stance left some readers, or at least one, feeling puzzled and disgruntled. If morality is not part of the fabric of the world, in what sense is morality real or objective at all? At about the same time, in an exploration of life and death issues such as abortion and euthanasia, Dworkin invoked the idea of the sacred. Insisting that the sacred need not be a religious concept, Dworkin emphasized the distinction between sacred or inviolable values on the one hand and merely instrumental values on the other. In fastening onto the idea of the sacred, it seemed that Dworkin had perhaps at last found the sort of idea he had needed all along in his efforts to resist instrumentalism and to defend categorical constraints on merely utilitarian laws and policies. And yet Dworkin's explication of the sacred seemed both half-baked and confessedly half-hearted. Once detached from its religious moorings, what does sacred even mean? Dworkin proposed that we regard some things as sacred or inviolable because they are the results of a long process we admire, such as artistic creation or natural evolution. We consider a great painting sacred because the artist put a lot of time and effort and genius into painting it. And we regret the loss of a species of plant or animal because it was the product of eons of evolution, so the disappearance of the species would amount to, quote, a waste of nature's investment. But this seemed a curious and uncompelling explanation. Does our evaluation of a painting by Rembrandt really turn on how long he took to do it? If it turned out that da Vinci dashed off the Mona Lisa in a week, as I'm told now Bernini did with his second version of Innocent the Tent, the uh, um, sculpture of Innocent in the Tent, uh, would we demote it from the category of masterpiece? Faced with this and other objections, Dworkin didn't even attempt actually to defend his process and loss of investment account of the sacred. Instead, he claimed merely to be describing intuitions many people in fact have, while at the same time purporting to be giving a revised and better account of beliefs that, as he acknowledged, people typically don't articulate in these terms. 
and having attributed these revised intuitions to people, Dworkin expressed his own doubts about whether the ostensible intuitions are ultimately rational or justifiable at all. Dworkin's somewhat convoluted discussion amounted to a tentative effort to support his anti-instrumentalist commitments by tapping into a religious notion, the sacred, even though he was at that point both unwilling to own the premises that gave the notion its significance and by his own admission unable to provide any persuasive defense of the concept. And so in his last posthumously published book, Dworkin explicitly embraced religion, albeit religious atheism, as he called it. Religion, he argued, need not include belief in God or gods. Rather, what he called the religious attitude rests on two beliefs or judgments. The first is that, quote, human life has objective meaning or purpose. The second is that, quote, what we call nature, the universe as a whole and in all its parts, is not just a matter of fact, but is itself sublime something of intrinsic wonder, value and wonder. These are judgments of value, Dworkin explained, and they have an essential emotional component, but the judgments are not merely subjective or emotive reactions. They are a response to actual realities in the universe. With that clarification, Dworkin maintained that we should, quote, take these two values, life's intrinsic meaning and nature's intrinsic beauty, as paradigms of a fully religious attitude to life. And the religious attitude serves to restore to us something that Weber and theorists of science and naturalism had pronounced forever lost, namely enchantment. As it happens, the two commitments identified by Dworkin correspond almost exactly to the two-themed account of religion we considered earlier. One theme associated with thinkers like Viktor Frankl and Jonathan Sachs sees religion as an affirmative response to the pervasive human desire or need for meaning. This is the first of Dworkin's elements of religion. The other theme, articulated by Rudolf Otto and Abraham Heschel, understands religion as the product of the human encounter with the holy or the sacred. Much like Otto, Dworkin described religious experience as numinous. Much like Heschel, Dworkin used terms like sublime, awe, and wonder to convey the religious attitude. Also like Otto, Heschel, and Sachs, moreover, Dworkin insisted that these judgments and emotions are not merely subjective. They are perceptions of something in the universe that is objectively real, even though it eludes the more naturalistic assumptions and devices of the scientists. Unlike for those thinkers, though, for Dworkin that something real was not anything lying beyond or behind the perceived sublimity, not any god or gods. Rather, the sublimity is a property or aspect of nature itself, including the part of nature that is human life. In this sense, Dworkin's religion would seem to be of the imminent variety. The sublime or the sacred is within and part of life and of nature, not something beyond or outside of, or something that transcends them. The imminent quality of Dworkin's religion is perhaps most clearly apparent in his admiring discussions of Spinoza and Einstein, whose philosophies he offered as representative of the kind of religious atheism he himself advocated. Spinoza, he observed, often talked about God, but, quote, Spinoza's God is not an intelligence who stands outside everything and who, through the force of its will, has created the universe and the physical laws that govern it. His God is just the complete set of physical laws considered under a different aspect. Under what aspect? Here Dworkin invoked Einstein, who also endorsed Spinoza's deity. And what was Einstein's understanding of that God? Einstein, quote, according to Dworkin, did not believe in a personal God, but he did worship nature. He regarded it with awe and thought that he and other scientists should be humble before its beauty and mystery. That is the sort of imminent religious atheism that Dworkin ultimately embraced. It's the last answer he managed to give to his long search for something with a categorical quality that could stand against the pervasive instrumentalism of the modern world, for something inviolable or sacred, something that could bring enchantment back into the world. But Dworkin didn't claim to be offering any novel insight but rather to be explicating a widely held position. He says, quote, many millions of people who count themselves as atheists have convictions and experiences similar to and just as profound as those that believers count as religious. They say that though they do not believe in a personal God, they nevertheless believe in a force in the universe greater than we are. They feel an inescapability, an inescapable responsibility to live their lives well with due respect for the lives of others. They take pride in a life they think well lived and suffer sometimes inconsolable regret at a life they think in retrospect wasted. They find the Grand Canyon not just arresting, but breathtakingly and eerily beautiful. They're not simply interested in the latest discoveries about vast space, but enthralled by them. These are not for them just a matter of immediate sensuous and otherwise inexplicable response. They express a conviction 
that the force and wonder they sense are real, just as real as planets and pain, that moral truth and natural wonder do not simply evoke awe, but call for it. These are common human judgments, emotions, and convictions, Dworkin was arguing, that cannot be fully accounted for and credited, as opposed to being explained away, by the matters of fact naturalism espoused by thinkers like Richard Dawkins, who comes in for a good deal of criticism in Dworkin's book. So insofar as many or most people have such judgments, emotions, and convictions, and do not attempt to dismiss them or explain them away, these people are harboring and acting on a view that is religious. And indeed, in the United States, Pew Foundation research indicates that a majority of self-described atheists report that they have regular feelings of awe or wonder at the universe, and the percentage is growing. In fact, a higher percentage of atheists than of Christians report this regular sense of wonder. I'm not sure what that means, uh, what the account of that is. Um, Dworkin's odyssey from moral conventionalism to utilitarianism all the way across to the enchantment of religion without God reflects a pattern discernible in other thinkers as well. Uh, in the longer project, I'll discuss some other examples, and perhaps in the elite secular culture generally. At stage one, thinkers look back wistfully, perhaps, on the enchanted world of antiquity and pronounce that world, alas, irretrievably lost. Science has rendered it unavailable to moderns with any education and critical ability. The first reaction to this loss is to announce the disenchantment and meaninglessness of the world. The announcement may be offered with resigned despair, as with Stace, or perhaps, as with Russell, with the darkly heroic satisfaction of Homeric warriors who are all the more admirable because they fight courageously on, knowing that they must soon die and that will be the end of everything. Then, upon reflection, secular thinkers declare that we can have ethics or morality after all. Indeed, we can place ethics upon an even more solid, because more true, secular foundation. And upon further thought, they announce the glad tidings that the secular naturalistic world is not as empty of enchantment or objective value as had been supposed. It turns out that amidst the nothing but matter in motion, as Stace put it, there is also beauty, value, goodness, enchantment, the sacred. Nor are these merely subjective emotions. They are objectively real. Why had we somehow supposed they had been lost? What was the reason for all of our existential angst? Why were we, or in any case our parents, so taken with Sartre and Camus and Samuel Beckett? What could we or they have been thinking? And what sort of religiosity is it that these people manifest? We've already seen that Dworkin's religion seems clearly to be of the imminent variety. The whole point of emphasizing this, this is a religion without God is to underscore that it doesn't depend on anything metaphysically exotic or transcendent. For Dworkin and for the millions of others, atheist or not, for whom his explanation might resonate, religion, a term they may embrace or may eschew, denotes a world not under the stern judgment of the biblical God, but rather a world re-enchanted with meaning and beauty in the way the world was enchanted before the inconvenient coming of Christianity. Could there be a more apt, succinct description of this spiritual orientation than modern paganism? But whether or not one chooses to use that level, that label, the one thing this type of worldview is not is naturalism, at least as a comprehensive philosophy. Now in the last uh, section of the paper, uh, I think I'll, I'll skip most of that, but just try and summarize it. Uh, here I distinguish among three different versions of the secular. Understanding secular, now the term, not so much in its current sense of not religion, uh, not religious, as in its more historical sense, meaning something like of and pertaining to this world. In some, history has handed down to us three broad categories or families of the secular. There's the pagan secular, in which heavy, if not exclusive, emphasis is placed on this world and this life. But this world and this life, or at least some parts or aspects of this world or this life, are viewed as having a sacred quality. Then there's the Christian secular, in which the sacred lies beyond time and space, and this temporal world and this life are a specialized area of God's domain. That's quoting Nomi Stolzenberg. As such, this life has value, indeed immense value, but, and because it is a subordinate piece of the larger domain of eternity. Finally, there's the distinctively modern naturalistic secular reflected in the worldview associated with modern science. This is the not religious and disenchanted world of Weber, Russell, and company. Each of these secular possibilities remains available to people today, and each has its adherents. Naturalistic secularism seems to be the official version, so to speak, and the one that naturally comes to mind, at least when the term secular is used. 
And yet, although there's no way to take an accurate head count, in practice, it is likely that the naturalistic version probably has the fewest real adherents. Most people, even including members of the cultural elite like Dworkin, are probably not simply secular in the naturalistic sense. They believe in science, to be sure, but they also have commitments and endorse values that are not reducible to the materialistic or naturalistic terms and entities that science studies. Nearly everyone, for example, will assert that human life is sacred, or that human persons, from birth onwards at least, have inviolable value or dignity. Perhaps there are exceptions. The playwright George Bernard Shaw, for example, uh, the philosopher John Gray reports, quote, throughout his life, the great, great playwright argued in favor of mass extermination as an alternative to imprisonment. It was better to kill the socially useless, he urged, than to waste public money locking them up. But if this was indeed Shaw's position, nearly all of us, whether we self-identify as liberal or conservative or as religious or secular, will react to it with horror because we would say human life is sacred or inviolable or infinitely precious or something of that sort. Insofar as we insist on some such proposition, we depart from the naturalistic secular in favor of something else, perhaps the transcendent secularism of tradition, traditional Christianity, perhaps the more eminent sacredness of modern paganism. In sum, it's entirely possible to describe the modern world as secular. That description is not so much wrong as uninformative and implicitly misleading. It leaves open and indeed serves to conceal the crucial question, what kind of secular? Secular in what sense? Naturalistic secularism may be appropriate to our scientific enterprises. In the realm of moral and political discourse and decisions, by contrast, it seems Eliot may have been closer to the mark in suggesting that the live choice is between the imminent religiosity of the pagan secular and the more transcendent religiosity of the Christian or Judeo-Christian secular. Acknowledging the cogency of Eliot's description might be valuable in helping us understand our contemporary situation. Instead of thinking of, say, the culture wars that rage in the United States and elsewhere in the inapt terms, or at least the unhelpful terms, of secular versus religion, for example, we might more helpfully understand them as a clash of competing religiosities. And beyond asking about the possibility of grounding ethics in secular or naturalistic premises, we might go on to ask the old but newly pertinent question, addressed at formidable length, for example, in Augustine's City of God, of the adequacy of the imminent religiosity manifest in ancient pagan religiosity and recently rearticulated in Dworkin's religion without God. We might reflect, in other words, on the philosophical and spiritual adequacy of modern paganism. Thank you. <laughs>